the need for blood affects us all. Experts say one out of every 10 patients in a hospital requires blood transfusion. However, for that transfusion to happen, someone has to donate blood, given that there are no substitutes for blood and blood components. This week on Health Digest, we look at how technology is revolutionizing the donation of blood and its various components and how this donation is helping transform treatment outcomes for patients with various conditions. The need for blood continues to grow around the world. In Kenya, volunteers like John Mugu from Nairobi play a critical role in helping the country bridge the current blood deficit. In the previous years, Mugu, who is a regular blood donor and also the chair of the O Negative Foundation, had to donate a whole unit of blood the traditional way. So how are you feeling? But today, he walks into this facility for the third time to donate platelets, one of the components that make up the human blood. I will start the needle. How the donation is going to happen is what strikes the eye. The procedure is rapidly growing in the blood collection field. This year I have donated, uh, this is the third time I have come to donate platelets because I donated in January, February and now March. What we do as a, as a, as a group is uh, responding to blood abuse so that we may save more lives. This component will be removed through a process known as apheresis. It is a procedure where single or more components are collected and the rest of blood components are returned back to the donor. However, before that happens... We collect a small sample, about two minutes, where we will do our polymogram to determine if at all the patient, the donor has enough platelet count, if at all the patient has got any underlying medical issues, and if the donor has, sorry, if the donor has enough blood count. In the traditional blood donation, a unit of whole blood is taken from a donor and sent to a laboratory. There, it is separated into its four components, namely the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets and plasma. In Mugo's case, the separation will happen while he is still connected to the machine, which uses a centrifuge to separate blood and its components by density. I will, I will, I will start the needle, then I will click on the machine to start the procedure. Thereafter, it will start the actual procedure of drawing blood. So it will draw blood, approximately like 20 to 50 mils of blood. Then the blood will get into the centrifuge. We have a centrifuge within the machine. So it will get the centrifuge where specific components will be separated. So the chosen components of which now we did choose the platelet components will be pumped to the bag. As you see, we have two bags. Huh? So the platelets will be pumped to the bags. Then the remaining components, which are the red blood cells and the plasma, they will be returned back to the body. So what do you look out for to determine uh, uh, whether a donor has enough platelets for you to draw some out of them? For you to donate, you need to have 250 number of platelets. So with him, with our donor here, his count was 300 and 56, which was quite good. So when we input the, the details, the, that is the weight, that is the height, the machine will be able to tell us the approximate amount, volume of blood that the donor has. If you get somebody with, the, with good platelet count and good height and weight, then it might take about 49 minutes for the machine, for the procedure to end. Experts say the quality and characteristics of platelets during storage is affected by a number of factors such as processing after collection, anticoagulant and centrifugation among others. The storage temperatures for all these three products are different. Like, and, and even the duration of storage is different. Like the red blood cells can be stored in a temperature of uh, between 2 to 6. That's actually refrigeration temperature between two to six for 
up to 42 days. And then the second product, the fresh frozen plasma, can be stored in, uh, in, in a temperature of minus 30 and below for up to three years. And now, surprisingly, the platelet concentrates is stored in room temperature and it only can be stored for five days. They argue that aphiresis donation procedures have fewer adverse events compared to whole blood derived platelets which require multiple donations to be sufficient to at least treat an adult. When you give one unit of aphoretic uh, platelets is equivalent to six to eight units of manually prepared platelets. Uh, this is very important to the, our mothers who have given birth and have uh, a PPH Number two, to the uh, patients who need uh, who, the cancer patients. In fact, those are the highest consumers of uh, aphoretic platelets. And uh, w one of the things I've realized in Nairobi that um, the demand is now so high. This also increases the risk of infectious agent transmission at least twofold as compared with aphoresis units they won. The collected components can be stored and distributed to hospitals for use depending on the medical needs. Their functions also vary, as explained by Festus Koech, who is the Nairobi Regional Blood Transfusion Center Manager. The second use of uh, fresh frozen plasma is uh, to correct vitamin K deficiency in uh, patients with bleeding disorders. So you find that uh, in, in cases like uh, menstrual bleeding, that is the therapy that we normally give the fresh frozen plasma because it corrects the, the deficiency of vitamin K. Plasma, which is the liquid component of blood that consists of a mixture of water, sugar, fat, protein and salt, can also be used to treat burns. The red blood cells, on the other hand, are said to be the most commonly transfused blood component. The major use of uh, platelets is to correct the bleeding. Eh? in case of uh, any bleeding, let's say patients with hemophilia. Hemophilia are people who are not able to produce enough uh, platelets in their system, maybe due to conditions like cancer that distracts the normal production of platelets, then we can infuse platelets which have been uh, uh, which, are, which have been preferred uh, externally. Blood and blood components provide unique and life-saving therapeutic benefits to patients like Victor Sirengo, a resident of Nairobi. The support that I received. Sirengo was diagnosed with cancer in June last year. What started as a bacterial infection followed by swelling of the lymph nodes would later see the lawyer undergo a battery of tests to facilitate a definitive diagnosis of his ailment. On my second visit, uh, to, uh, I met another surgeon uh, who upon examining, of course, the entire uh, procedure that had happened and the result that they obtained, he, his opinion was this was not just one type of a cancer but two types of cancers. And so uh, they referred me to, K, uh, to Kenyatta Cancer Treatment Center for further tests and confirmation of that. Uh, while I was walking to, uh, outside the hospital, I had a lot of questions in mind. More than 40,000 people are diagnosed with cancer in Kenya annually. Experts say many of them will require blood or blood components during chemotherapy. When I presented the results to my doctor, uh, she was so concerned about my platelets. My platelets were at 21. So she was a bit shocked as to how I was even surviving and moving around because it meant my immunity was extremely low. My uh, HP levels were also very low at that time. And when she mentioned to me is when I, uh, I was able to relate uh, because during the entire journey, I kept on experiencing a lot of fatigue, a lot of uneasiness. There was even a period where I could not eat any food at all. I kept on vomiting. Experts say various types of cancers can affect the number of red blood cells or platelets which will require a patient to undergo their transfusion. Cancers like leukemia originating in the bone marrow can also reduce blood counts. For Sirengo, who was diagnosed with leukemia, getting his platelets levels in check became another nightmare. 
This was compounded by the high cost of transfusing the blood component. With the few uh, donors who are around and available, I was able again to do another two pints of blood. Went back with my results still, it was insufficient. And then I had to ask the doctor, what can we do, we do more than two? Uh, is it um, something that will be life-threatening to do five or six pints of blood for an individual? Because as a patient, you really want to get done with it. You're also even tired. Uh, and even your anticipation uh, for the treatment is kind of like uh, you know, giving you the hunger for you know, getting done with these things because it essentially means your life has to stop. Uh, so the doctor said that this time around, I don't think you would go for a uh, full blood transfusion. Um, there's something called aphoresis platelets. Maybe that is what thing that you need to do. And the doctor had recommended two pints of platelets. He told only to realize it was a 75,000 for one pint. And this came as a shock. Similarly, Amina Fazal Karim from Pangani in Nairobi also depends on blood components for her daughter's well-being. The mother of two says her eldest daughter was diagnosed with the most severe form of a rare blood disorder that affects the body's ability to produce hemoglobin and healthy red blood cells known as thalassemia. She has to be transfused with two pints of blood every month. She was diagnosed in, uh, in around when she was four years old. But uh, before that, she had some symptoms and some conditions we were, which we were not understanding what it is. And then when we went to, we went to different doctors and uh, everybody had, uh, nobody could know exactly what problem she has. So there was a doctor, she did one of her tests and we had to say, we ha I had to take it to, to a, to a hospital and they send it, they said that this test can only be done in India. So they had sent it to India and when I got the test, we, we came to know that she's got this uh, problem of thalassemia major. For the longest time, just like many patients who require blood or blood components transfusion, her biggest challenge was finding donors to donate blood for her daughter, not forgetting the costs that come with the procedure. It was a really big challenge for me. I had to look for the donors. I have to take them to different places to donate. The solution is bone marrow transplant. But before that, we can be transfusing her blood like every month. And according to her uh, situation, what it is, Whenever she needs blood, we need to transfuse her. Um, but otherwise, she's okay. There's no problem. The problem is only that uh, her spleen gets swollen sometimes. You can see her stomach is swollen. And uh, when we asked the doctor, he said yes, because she's not getting enough oxygen, because she does not have enough blood in her body. So even the spleen sometimes gets uh, it enlarges. About 200 kilometers away from Nairobi, 38 year old Tabitha Wairimo from Nakuru remains a testament of what the life saving liquid component can do for patients. She suffers from ulcerative colitis, a condition characterized by inflammation of the inner lining of the large intestines and rectum. At the age of 12, I remember that's when it started. I used to refuse blood, I used to get transfused a lot. And we didn't know what the, what the cause was. So I used just to go and get transfused, they check everything, they say I'm okay, then go back home, then after maybe a year, then I'm back to the hospital. But uh, in 2005, that's when they found out what the cause was. Apart from medications she takes to treat the condition, she depended on blood transfusion for years. She remains the highest recipient of blood in Kenya. 2013, I was transfused around 26 or 27 units of blood. Although she doesn't undergo transfusion anymore, Wairimu says it takes the bold donation of people like Kennedy Sanya to help give patients like her a second chance at life. Sanya is a resident of Nakuru who is ranked the highest blood donor in the country. There are people who, who think that for you to donate blood, you have to have, they have to be given an incentive. It's not proper because this is something voluntary. And if the, if the government begins 
giving people incentives for blood, Kidogo will have issues because people will start selling their blood. And I think that would be very, very wrong. Kenya's blood banks are holding less than what is required for transfusion. This points to an acute shortage that has over the years forced families to crowdsource for the product. As we are advancing and developing as a country, now we have issues of uh, uh, transplants. We have uh, issues of increased uh, non-communicable diseases, especially cancers. And the cancers actually we require a lot of blood. So our approximate session is that as much as WHO says 1%, but actually uh, with these English technologies of transplants, uh, now cancers and the rest, we actually should be aiming at collecting a million pints of blood per year. The Kenya Tissue and Transplant Authority, which is mandated by the government to ensure the provision of adequate safe blood and blood products, is now banking on a number of strategies to help bridge the deficit. We have also engaged now the ambassadors. Uh, we have four of them. Uh, these ambassadors, basically, they are there to make sure that they do we educate the people, we inspire the people, and mobilize for us. <coughs> so that we can be able to collect blood and also to educate people some, you know, there are a lot of myths around blood eh? and a lot of misconceptions. So that's why we went uh, out so that we have these ambassadors so that people can understand the issues of blood. Blood transfusion is an essential component of quality medical care. However, for many Kenyans, administrative challenges and lack of regulation on the cost of transfusion services leaves majority disadvantaged. The poorest in the society who can't bear that cost are the most affected. One thing I was able to gather through all that first, that uh, there are instances where patients themselves really don't know what or where to go to um, and how much it costs when it comes to such things. Of course, you get to hear, you sit in a, um, in a hospital and you get to hear experiences of other patients and they get to tell you of how much they have paid for this particular uh, service and you realize people are trying to monetize it out there. Um, and that's a sorry state for you know, sick patients who are really in urgent need of such you know, a crucial component in terms of uh, aiding them in their uh, medication, or even the journey in terms of treatment. Number one, the hostels must do cross-match. Number two, the hostels must purchase a giving set. Number three, they must purchase a granula. Number four, there's a nurse to give that blood and to monitor how the blood is being given. So, from our side, we give free, but hospitals also we should not, not just condemn them wholesome because there must be some service. They are offering us some service. Now we have a policy in place which is ready and I think uh, any time it will be, it's going to be launched. Uh, number two, we have a bill and through the bill now we'll have regulations which will regulate all this. And maybe during this time that we encourage Kenyans to come and uh, give us our views because at the end they're the ones who donate this blood. So we really want their views. In what now seems to be a move to ramp up donation of blood and to make the entire process from donation to transfusion open and accountable, the Ministry of Health is banking on a digital platform known as Damo KE that also gives data on how many units of blood are there countrywide and where specific blood groups are located. Blood is a constant demand for the treatment of various conditions. Experts say the need for this precious commodity never stops. So every blood donation you make could go a long way in giving the recipient a second chance at life. Gloria Milimu, KTN News.